Today I am speaking with my hero, Richard Dawkins. He is an internationally best-selling author. Among his books are The Selfish Gene, The Blind Watchmaker, The God Delusion, The Greatest Show on Earth, The Magic of Reality, and many more. And uh, it's just such a privilege to have Richard on today. Thanks for coming on, Richard. Thank you for having me. So what's new in the world of Richard Dawkins? What's been keeping you busy lately? Well, I've just been finishing off a book called Outgrowing God, which is a kind of um, young person's version of the God delusion, I suppose, although it doesn't cover the same chapters, uh, but it is an anti-God book for young people. Right, and and how, yeah, like, I, I feel like we need more and more literature that um, that gives this option to young people and to and to parents, uh, for sure. How important is it that we have more literature like this? I think it's very important. When you think of the sheer volume of literature, of religious literature that's out there for young people, I think it's very important to try to break the cycle of parent to child to grandchild, etc., where religion simply gets passed down from generation to generation and people are brought up with it without really thinking about it for themselves. They just take on the religious beliefs of their parents and their schooling and all that kind of thing. So breaking the cycle, breaking that, that round and round cycle that goes on and all the time, I want to achieve that and that's what I hope this book will do. Right, and I think something that goes hand in hand with this, I, I think there, uh, there also needs to be an intervention of of skepticism being kind of the norm that we teach in in schools um, and uh, and kind of adding that um, curriculum to the school program is there is, I mean is skepticism part of the cure uh, to to help these kids out of dogmatism I think it is and I think that might be the next book um, right but th this one is, is about I mean the thing is things like homeopathy and telepathy and water divining and things like that and just a general skeptical attitude I mean, I thoroughly approve of that, yes. And we must be careful not to kill the imagination. It's, we don't want to say that we don't love stories and, and even fairy stories, as long as they're taken with a measure of skepticism. Right, and I think as long as we're categorizing that as art, as opposed to uh, in some way that the, the belief in fairies should be taken as a scientific proposition, <laughs> I think if we... Yeah, make, well, nobody uh, actually is in fairies, but nevertheless, um, there, is a, there is a need for a greater skeptical outlook, I think. And um, with, without destroying imagination, without destroying poetry and art, we do need to have a more skeptical attitude. Right, I couldn't agree more. So on uh, October 23rd in Chicago, you will speak with evolutionary theorist Brett Weinstein. Um, so uh, typically when you're speaking with uh, another evolutionary scientist, what are some topics that you like to get into that, that you might not be able to with just um, a philosopher? Oh, well, um, I think there's quite a lot we can talk about. Uh, the, the various, I mean, I, it, evolutionary science is in a very exciting phase at the moment with molecular genetics. It's become a branch of information technology, which is certainly wasn't in Darwin's time. Darwin would have been, I think, both bewildered and thrilled by the way his own subject is taken off now. And so that's certainly a nice thing to talk about. Um, that helps us to understand the pedigree of life. We can now have a sporting chance of actually reconstructing the entire family tree of life. And really the, the limit is just the, the time and money spent on sequencing DNA or sequencing proteins. So that's an exciting field. Um, paleontology is moving along fast. Um, I'm not quite sure what uh, what Brett Weinstein wants to talk about, but I'll be interested to hear anyway. I know a, a really interesting subject for him is the evolution of religiosity in human beings and whether it's uh, a bug or a or or a necessity. And I think this will be a really interesting topic for you guys to touch on. There may be some points of uh, contention that you guys will be able to work through. Yes, well, I've described it as a religion as a virus of the mind. I, right. don't, I don't know if that's what you meant by a bug. Yeah. But, um, yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. Very cool. I think everyone's really looking forward to that. Uh, Brett's been making, you know, a lot of a lot of interesting waves, and and uh, and he's been providing some great education from an evolutionary standpoint. So I think he's a very important voice going forward. Um, 
So it seems like the world is becoming more secular, at least through my eyes, and I, and I feel like it's happening rapidly. Do you, do you notice this? The polls suggest that that's true, uh, certainly in Western Europe and actually in America too. The polls are all moving in the right direction. I think it's something like more than 20% of Americans now describe themselves as having no religion, which is a great advance on the past. And I think it's going to carry on, especially because if you look at, if you poll young people, especially, you find that the figure is a lot higher. <clears throat> right. Um, yeah, I spent a lot of time with university and college types. And I mean, I, I cannot remember the last time, and I meet hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, of students. And just in those conversations, I can't remember the last time I came across anyone that's uh, harbor, harboring any theistic uh, belief systems. So it seems uh, oh, well, uh, rare. I'm not sure about that. I mean, I, I'm rather distressed to see, even in Oxford, which it should be a sort of elite university, there's the Chris, Christian Union is very, very active, and mm. they seduce young people, young freshmen who are sort of lonely and need befriending. And um, no, they're 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 a ruthless lot. Right. Yeah. It's a, a and you know it's such a you know it's. <sighs> It's such an attractive um, belief system in, in a few different ways to some people if they don't look at some of these passages as, as literal, but it's, it's hard um, to get over that for people. If you look at, if you look at these uh, religious systems um, from a skeptic's perspective, I think. Uh, yeah, and uh, so what i was i was going to ask you um outside of religion and god belief are there some common myths um scientifically that you come across regularly that you are constantly having to debunk or or educate people on well within my own field of evolution i do you mean i mean thing, things like um uh well i'll believe in evolution when i see and see an ape turn into a human that kind of thing right. <laughs> There's plenty of that sort of stuff about it. Yeah. I saw uh, only this week somebody told me about the Minister of Education in India, the Federal Minister of Education, actually said that. said, we must stop teaching evolution in the schools because I've never seen an ape turn into a human. I mean, that sort of, the, someone of that idiotic caliber is actually a Minister of Education yeah. in a leading country in the world. Yeah, like how do they, I mean, how do they reconcile that? Do they just value what... Um, like the, the, you know, the educational value to what he has to offer is so high that when they hear stuff like that, they can just brush it off their shoulders. Don't know. I mean, I, I've no idea how how some how how somebody of that low caliber could have possibly have got that job. But anyway, right. So, I mean, I haven't looked into the case. Um, and and is there still should we look at value in in say if we have a professor that. Um, even an evolutionary biologist professor that um, believes in uh, religious fairy tales as being actually true, should we still look at where they can be valued from an ed educational standpoint, or should we want them to, or I mean, can we even stomach having these people uh, teach anymore? Well, I suppose you have to make a distinction between uh, sophisticated religious people who have no problem with evolution, obviously, uh, and, I mean, bishops and archbishops and things have no problem with evolution. Um, so I think it would be very intolerant to say we can't, we can't stomach them. But I do think that we should look very carefully at anybody who's teaching, who actually teaches arrant nonsense, factual nonsense, like six-day creation, something like that. Right. Um, I mean, you've obviously spent a lot of time in your life thinking about uh, how... Um, this pr process of life um, could have uh, got going in the first place. Um, are you? Are we any closer to that answer, or or do you have kind of your your um, best educated guess based on the evidence that is available for that? Well, that's a big open question. I mean, what, once once evolution got started, once we have a proper genetics going, once DNA was there, then we pretty much understand the whole process. But the start of it, uh, the, the very first gene, the very first, wouldn't have been DNA, the very first self-replicating molecule, which was necessary before natural selection could get started, that's still a big puzzle. And there are various theories. I think the sort of the vogue theory at the moment is the RNA world theory, which I think is sounds pretty plausible to me, but there's no very positive evidence in favor of it. Right. 
Yeah, it, uh, it, it's, it's just always a, an interesting question. It's a question everyone seems to want to know. Um, but uh, I, I, do, do you think we'll, we'll ever get um, closer to understanding that? I mean, will it come down to being able to replicate this process in the lab? Well, because we don't know the conditions under which it happened, I think the best we can hope for is that somebody will come up with a model which is so beautiful and so elegant that we'll, we will say, oh, yes, it had to be like that. And that's, that's, so, that's so elegantly clear that it, it must have been like that. And I think we're a long way from that at the moment. Right. And you've, you've always talked about the beauty of evolution and, and how it, it just creates this... Um, beautiful uh, hierarchy of this um, family tree and uh, what what do you think the hurdle is in in people seeing the beauty in something like evolution like coming from very simplistic uh, beginnings into complicated life forms like what's the hurdle there I think it's difficult for people to believe that such prodigious complexity could have come about by the unaided laws of physics through, through, filtered through the sort of rather, rather special process of natural selection. And it, it is a big ask to, to, to accept that something as complicated as, well, just a fly or a bee or something, let alone a human. Um, this, a bee is a little robot vehicle which buzzes about under the control of its sense organs. It's got wings that it can control. It can fly in all sorts of complicated ways. Um, it is a big ask to say this is a robot vehicle which has been put together under the laws of physics by this process called natural selection. I, I do sympathize with people who find it hard to believe. The alternative is no easier to believe, of course. Right. Yeah, it, it definitely does take a level of uh, understanding the evidence, too, and, and this always seems to be a problem because it is, it, it's... It's not necessarily an easy concept to grasp, but it, it's, it's... Oh, and I, th I think yeah. that's probably the explanation for why it took so long. I've always been a bit curious, in a way, why it took until the middle of the 19th century for anybody to get it. I mean, two centuries later than Newton, and what Newton did would seem, on the face of it, far cleverer, far more difficult to, gr to come to, 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 to grasp it. It had to wait until the 19th century, and then it was grasped several, at least twice independently, Darwin and Wallace and possibly others. Um, and I think possibly historically the reason why it took so long was that it would have seemed to people so obvious that there had to be a divine designer. There couldn't be any other explanation. And yet they were wrong. It took a, an act of, I think, real courage for Darwin to say, no, let's just look and see whether there is a, 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 a non-intelligent, a non-creator explanation for this and once he thought of it it's spectacularly simple it's so simple that you wonder why nobody thought of it before but as I say I think the reason they never thought of it before was that it somehow seemed obvious there couldn't possibly be any explanation other than a divine creator right um, so uh, well, one thing I wanted to, to chat about is there uh, is this problem of genital mutilation around the world. Um, we, I mean, a lot of this, uh, basically all of it, as far as I can see in, in human history, is is tied to um, religious belief systems. Um, and it's very easy to point at uh, female gen genital mutilation in the West, and, and obviously uh, this should be stopped, and we need to go after the people who are doing this. Um, but what do you think about the prevalence of uh, male genital mutilation or male cutting in, in Western culture? It's a little bit odd, isn't it, that God is supposed to have made us in his own image, and the first thing right. he asked us to do is <laughs> chop a bit of us it off. Yeah. <laughs> it's just a slightly strange anomaly. Um, yeah. I, I think it's important not to equate the two. I mean, um, right. female genital mutilation is a deliberate effort to spoil sexual pleasure. And I don't think that's what male circumcision is about. I'm not quite sure what it is about, but, it, but it's not in the same class. And I, I prefer not to 
to lump them together. I mean, I've noticed that whenever anybody puts on Twitter, for example, a condemnation of FGM, it immediately unleashes a great torrent of what what about male genital mutilation. Right. And that's fair enough, but I don't think they should be equated. Yeah, I think equating it is is uh, is a mistake. Um, I think it's just obvious that the the detriments uh, for female gen- genital mutilation are just so much grander and greater on a much larger scale. Um, and deliberately, they're deliberately setting out to spoil sexual pleasure for a lifetime. Yeah, and it's and it's interesting. I know some Jewish scholars talk about the the reason why um, the male genital mutilation craze started was, I, I mean, in fact, they did want to um, basically numb the organ to a sense and try to try to um, you know stop this mass amount of uh, masturbation that was happening in sex in their culture. I, I know that was, <laughs> but. I mean, it's uh, that, that was the motivation of Kellogg. You know, you know, yeah. Kellogg, the cornflakes man. Yes, yes. <laughs> he was fanatical about circumcision for exactly that reason. He thought yeah. he was trying to stop masturbation. Right. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, yeah. You can't uh, destroy all the lubricants in the world. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, no, I, I find it interesting that um, we we still are doing this to infants, and and as far as I can tell, I've I've read all the literature on it, and it seems like this is something we're doing to infants for 100% almost non medically necessary reasons. So I I just find it uh, to be interesting that we're kind of still carrying this out in the West. I think it's I think it's something that we're we're overlooking and that if we actually took time to look at it we would say oh why the hell are we doing this yes i mean i, I gather it's very prevalent in the united states and nothing to do with religion but but it just sort of is, is is a custom yeah and it, it was in britain until quite recently mm-hmm. as well i mean not not 100 percent about maybe about 50 i mean i i went to boarding schools and so i'm, I'm sort of got a fairly good statistical sample it's about 50 percent right. in, in britain and not correlated with religion or anything else, as far as I can tell. It's just hard to know what's correlated with. Right, and and I think as far as I can tell, the people who have really studied this, it's about thirty percent of the males on this planet are um, are cut at birth, and uh, and seventy percent are not. So I think it's actually, it's it's um, you know the the numbers are going down because I think we've seen that other cultures get along just fine without doing this to infants. Is that true in the United States, do you know? Um, I think the United States is, is actually closer to 50-50 or even 60-40. Uh, oh, yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, okay. and, and then most, uh, in, in most uh, Asian countries, it's, it hardly is never done. So, um, yes. Yeah. Um, so here's a question. What's, what do you think the greatest ideological threat uh, to humanity is um, these, these days in these current modern times? Oh gosh, I don't know. Let me think. I mean, militant Islam is obviously up there. Right. Um, not just the greatest, but it's the that comes to the yes, an ideological threat, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe um, um, Catholic um, uh, opposition to condoms is another one. Yes. Yeah. And that's clearly ideological. Mm-hmm. One thing I, uh, I I go to often when I when I think about this question is just the just anti science, just yes. anti scientific thinking. Yes, and that does have a sort of ideological dimension to it, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, I, I you know I try to spend my life <laughs> eradicating anti science in any way that I can, and you know these anti anti scientific beliefs are just so damaging, I think, to human progress, and I think damaging human progress that could potentially get us to a level where we become more sustainable as a species is... is, is yes, I mean, do, do you see that in intellectual circles, in university circles, for example? Well, I don't, I'm, I'm seeing it uh, much less um, 
kind of it, it seems like there's been this explosion of intellectualism and this explosion of not wanting to be the one holding the indefensible position from a from a scientific perspective so i think that movement like it's becoming popular to think as far as i can tell uh even in the past five years there's been this explosion with um you know with with these uh, large-scale live events i've been doing with scientists and intellectuals we just broke the record for 8500 people coming out to hear two electro uh two intellectuals speak um uh, on a large uh, arena stage so i think we're at this this new level of of um the need for intellectual discourse and and the want to be um included in that so i think we're getting to a uh, pretty is, good is there an, is there a sort of academic movement that says something like science is only one kind of ideology and um science is just a tool for patriarchal oppression and that kind of thing have you come across that yeah it's i i see it coming from the the extreme left um and i I, I see if there are undesirable scientific findings that are verifiably true, um, rather than um, taking the reasoned approach to those truths, these truths want to be uh, kind of stricken from the record. Yes, I have come across that too. If there's an undesirable truth, say uh, one thing that um, really gets people up in arms is these studies that have been done um, trying to see if there's anything, uh, if, if there's IQ differences generally from uh, between races. And I know, uh, I know that uh, really gets people up in arms. And, they, and if, there, there is, if there happens to be findings, and I don't know if there is anything compelling there, um, that say uh, a black person, because they happen to be black, generally will have a lower IQ than a white person. If this if this finding happened to be true, um, scientifically based on on some kind of model, then the uh, the knee jerk reaction would be to hide that finding and throw it away, as opposed to dealing with the truth of that. Yes, it say it, it it mustn't be allowed to be true. Right. But I think what we should be saying is something like, um, if 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 there was a statistical tendency in that direction. It should have absolutely no impact whatsoever on our political decisions and our decisions on how to hire people or anything like that. But to say that it mustn't be allowed to be true, yes. that we falsify the science, yeah. um, be going too far. Yeah, I think that's, that's a dangerous thing to do because all of a sudden we might find a piece of evidence about uh, human evolution down in the, in the future that people might find undesirable and want to strike it from the record. Yes. Yeah. Um, how how important is it? So at Pangburn Philosophy, we started um, translating all of our uh, live event discussion uh, content into Arabic, and uh, and we're 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 going to be doing this in different languages as well. And uh, we actually just released our first video, and it's actually uh, really got a lot of legs in the in the Arabic speaking community. So there seems to be a, a hunger to spread. Um, intellectual discourse in in Arabic speaking countries. Um, obviously, you uh, I don't know what the figure is now, but how many times has the God delusion been downloaded uh, in? I think it was even or in the Arabic language. What's that? Yes, thirteen million is the, is wow. the figure that I've heard. Um, and we've started a new project. Uh, CFI has started a new project um, to translate several of my books into not just Arabic, but um, uh, Urdu and uh, um, Indonesian and other languages of um, Islamic countries. And that's going ahead well. We've got a, a couple of benefactors who are helping with that. Um, and so we're very, very pleased about that. Um, are you doing the, your um, YouTube videos in, into Arab, did, did you say? Yes, yeah. So we uh, all of our free content that ends up on YouTube were... Um, is that... Is that Subtitles or, or dubbed or what? Yes, it's uh, we, we do, we're doing it with subtitles for now. We did look at doing the language, uh, the the dubbing itself, and um, I guess the the polls when we when we looked at some polls on what people prefer in these other countries, they preferred the subtitles. So that's kind I of. I should hope. I, I I hate the idea of dubbing. Do it. Do it yeah. with subtitles. 
Yeah, yeah. I think it, I think it's better. It's uh, I always find it weird to even watch a Hollywood film when it's been dubbed with a different language. It just seems strange. I feel very strongly about this because I'm actually trying to learn both French and German. Right. And I would love to do it by watching films and, and just watching newsreels and things. And it's maddening when you get about two words of the language you're trying to learn and then they fade it out and you get the voice of an interpreter instead. And that infuriates me. Right. Um, so I, th I wanted to ask you as a point of interest for me, um, what are some other scientific fields that you like keeping an eye on? Like what, what interests uh, you most outside of uh, biology? Well, computer science and um, astronomy, uh, cosmology, uh, planetary science. I mean, I'm looking forward to my conversation with Carolyn Porco, for example. Oh, yes. Had a, well, one, one with you and, and a couple with, with, um, with my own foundation. Um, looking forward to that very much. I'm utterly fascinated by that, and I hope to learn a lot. And as I say, computer science as well. Yeah, um, and that'll be on uh, October 22nd for everyone listening in uh, Calgary, Alberta. This will be our first um, large event in Calgary, and we are almost sold out for that event. So please uh, get your tickets so you can come down and see Richard and Carolyn uh, uh, have a conversation. And then we'll also be with um, Richard um, on November 1st at the beautiful Beacon Theater in New York City with Brian Green. Uh, Richard, are you familiar with Brian? Of course I am, yes. Yeah. In fact, I've, been, I've had a conversation with him on stage before. Right. And, and what do you think of uh, his theoretical uh, approach to physics and, and uh, just as a mathematician? He, he's quite a bright man, isn't he? Of course he is. You're asking me to, 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 to <laughs> speak about Brian Greene's physics. Of course I can't do that. But I hope to learn something again, as, as I say. Yeah. Um, uh, why don't we talk about... Um, are you are you of the camp that's uh, worried about the the level that artificial intelligence could reach to, and and if so, do you think it's ever going to get outside of our control? Uh, people I respect are very worried about it. People like Elon Musk and Stephen Hawking. Um, I think it very easily could get out of our control. I'm not one of those who thinks you can just pull the plug out. You can't do that. Yeah. Um, I'm genuinely curious to know how far it can go. I mean, I, as a naturalist, I am committed to the view that anything the human brain can do can in principle be done in silico with software. Um, so I think it can be done. Um, forecasts of the imminent takeover by artificial intelligence have fallen a bit short. So it's being a bit slower than people one time feared or hoped. Um, on the whole, I'm an optimist. I mean, I'm so curious about what can be done. And I can't help a sort of nigg niggling feeling that possibly they might do a better job of it than we're doing. <laughs> yeah, I guess it depends on their relationship, what their relationship will be to their pleasure drive, I think. Because it yeah. seems like we're just at the mercy of our pleasure drive and we just, uh, we're the last to know what we're doing in a sense. And we're just... Um, uh, reacting to our environment um, is is that going to be the key to figure out like what's going to be the driving force behind AI to want? Well, in to principle, we can yeah. program into them whatever pleasure drive we want to, I suppose. Right. Um, but um, no, I, I'm actually curious. I, I like science fiction too, and I'm curious to see in a science fictiony kind of way what may happen. Uh, but it may take rather longer than we think. It may, may be that I'll be dead before it, before anything very much more happens. Yeah, yeah, it is. it's hard to tell. It seems like when we do uh, start making uh, really big steps towards the final conclusion or answer, um, things start happening rapidly. So maybe tomorrow we will be enslaved by robots. <laughs> maybe. As I say, it might not be too bad a thing. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for talking with me today, Richard. I didn't go quite just yet. I just wanted to mention when I was talking about my book for young people, oh, there's yes. another book working on for, for even younger people, for, for young children. Again, not quite sure what that might be called, but it might be called OMG, I Think I'm an Atheist. Yes. And that's, that's, for, that's for children of about sort of 10 or so, which is, which is a quite separate book from Outgrowing God, which is kind of aimed at teenagers. And that's going to be a picture book. 
That's and brilliant. I'm still looking for a publisher for that. So if any publisher is listening in who wants to to, to publish a, a a beautifully illustrated picture book on atheism for children, then I'd like to hear from them. Well, I'm, I want to put my name at the top of the list. I would love to publish Good. it. <laughs> um, but we can talk about that more. Um, Please, let's. Yes. Yes, I'm. Uh, I'm. I'm so passionate about your work, Richard, and I. Um, I. I think these books for children are so important, especially for the parents who want to have some literature that their their children are going to be interested in that that uh, don't have to do with um, you know some kind of religious dogma or, or, or with religious undertones of some kind. So I think this is just so important. Are, are you a publisher, in fact? Um, well, we're starting actually to publish works for young um, skeptic writers, and so we're kind of in the very early s stages of this. But uh, we are uh, like we're going to be publishing Armin uh, Navabi's next book, and um, we also are going to uh, be publishing my first book here soon, uh, basically about um, pleasure and uh, the role that it plays in our lives and, and how do we, you know, uh, basically the, um, the, what I'm getting at in the book is, is trying to combat things like pedophilia and how do we get ahead of uh, pedophilia in the mind so that um, it doesn't manifest itself uh, in reality. So Right, good. Yeah. Yes. Okay, well, thank you so much for coming on today, Richard. I really appreciate it, and uh, I look forward to seeing you in Chicago and in Calgary and in New York. I think we're, we're going to have some great events, and they're selling really well, so there's going to be lots of people there. I look forward to it. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much, Richard. Everyone, right. this has been the um, Penguin Philosophy Podcast. Let art and science inspire. I am here today with... Dr. Jordan Peterson, best-selling author with his most recent hit, 12 Rules for Life, and a clinical psychologist extraordinaire. Cleaning your room, literally and as a metaphor. I was going to ask you, Jordan, what about one's office? Because mine is a literal shit show. Well, it's hard to say. Does it suit your purposes? That's I, the real issue. I feel like it does, but I... I I'm overwhelmed at times mm -hmm. by the state that it's in. Well, what I would recommend practically is that every time you go into your office, you spend like three minutes cleaning it. No more than three, because you'll probably do that, right? And then you can whittle away at it incrementally, which is a very good way to solve problems. Hmm. And then you could find out over time if having it in a more ordered state was actually stopping you from avoiding because one of the things that that kind of chaotic space does, and it's also indicative of, it, what it does is increase the probability that you'll avoid. Because the messes are unspecified, and therefore they, well, what they do technically is activate your predator, your predator avoidance systems, which is probably mm. not all that good. So you could experiment with it. You know, and the other thing you can do is walk into a space like that, and you have to ask yourself, take a look around, attend to it, look at it, because you probably won't because you're probably avoiding it visually. But take a look at, to take a look at it and see if, see how it sits with you. You know, as if you're, in, as if you're asking someone you don't know, you know, because you don't know yourself that well. And you might find that it actually doesn't sit with you very well. Now, you know, there are reasons for mess that are sometimes not mere lack of discipline and attention. You know, you might be preoccupied with other things necessarily and it got beyond you for some reason temporarily. Or maybe there's a method in your madness. But generally, when people are surrounded by disorder, it's something that's crept up on them and it's actually not good for them. Right. Okay. Well, um, so we're, we're here in Toronto. You're going to be taking the stage with Matt Dillahunty, former Southern Baptist, fundamentalist Christian for 25 years, believed he was meant to be a preacher, now a prominent figure in the promotion of secular humanism. So that's still a preacher. What are the similarities that you see between uh, kind of what you, what you would call a preacher of secular humanism and a preacher of Christianity? Well, there's, there seems at least to be the commonality of, let's say, theatrical approach because a church in many ways is a theater 
or what is really the case is the theater is a secularized church. That's actually the developmental progression. And atheism seems to have be developed, at least in part, in some of its manifestations, let's say, into something approximating a movement. And you could say, well, it's usually based in something philosophically like humanism, which is a form of, from my perspective, from, from my, let's say, psychological perspective, it's a religious belief system with fundamental axioms that are as grounded in faith as the next set of stories about how to conduct yourself. So I would just say, generally speaking, that the humanist types are unconscious of the mythological substructure of their beliefs. That doesn't mean they don't have them. They have mythological substructures because you can't escape from them. Our thought is embedded in metaphor. There's no way out of that. So that would be the similarities. And then there's the evangelical aspect of it too. You know, there's, there's the sense that I get from people like Dawkins and Harris and Dillahunty, although I'm less familiar with him, that there's a mission to be accomplished, you know, to rid the world of a particular form of scourge, which generally is construed as something like irrationality. And like, who's in favor of irrationality? Fair enough. And it, it's certainly the case that religious believers can be irrational. But my sense, generally speaking, with the, with the vocal atheist types is they've never really contended with the with the, with the real thinkers on the religious front. So, you know, taking on the fundamentalist Christians, it's like, well, in some ways, it's like shooting fish in a barrel. It's not really, I mean, I'm not trying to be derogatory. I understand the fundamentalist position, and I have some appreciation for it. I know that the fundamentalist types are trying desperately to support an ethos that they regard as highly valuable, and I have plenty of sympathy for that perspective. But as an intellectual enterprise, arguing against fundamentalism is really not a particular challenge. Mm -hmm. So that's how I look at it anyways. Um, and I think uh, uh, maybe why it seems like a good way to spend your time as, as from an atheistic standpoint is that uh, the hope is maybe some of these fundamental belief systems that are fundamentally anti-scientific may be eradicated by reason. Yeah, the thing is, I don't think so, because I think that the, the real issue at stake is never really, is never really dealt with. There is a, see, the, the atheist types, as far as I can tell, won't admit to the utility of the metaphoric viewpoint. And that's a great mistake on their part. Like it's, an, it's a mistake that's really grounded in a, fu a fundamental sort of, sort of blindness. Now, the problem is, is that there's an antithesis between the scientific viewpoint and, let's say, the metaphoric viewpoint, and it's an antithesis that we don't really know how to overcome. But by telling the metaphoric types that they should abandon their metaphors and flip to the scientific viewpoint, that's no way to get them to do that, because they're not going to abandon their metaphoric viewpoint any more than the atheists are. I mean, although they don't admit to the fact that they are grounded in metaphor just like everyone else. So I don't think it's an, uh, a particularly useful approach. I don't have anything against the attempt to, let's say, enlighten people with regards to certain fundamental scientific realities. I mean, I think the the idea that the Earth is 4,000 years old, I think it was Bishop Barclay, but that might be wrong, who calculated that 150 years ago or thereabouts. I may be wrong about all of that, but um, the, the, the fundamentalists confuse the biblical texts with scientific theory. Well, that's not useful. The people who wrote the Bible weren't scientists, obviously, right. since there weren't any scientists until about 500 years ago. So that's just self-evident. Whatever they were doing was something other than science. And to point out to the fundamentalists that religion is not science is... It does, the problem is it doesn't address the problem. Religion isn't science, but it's something. And that something has to be grappled with deeply. And I don't see that among the atheist community. Yeah, I think the uh, one of the main problems that I see when I look at a belief system that subscribes to an all-powerful, all-knowing being is that that being may communicate in a way that's harmful or damaging to that person. For instance, if the being was to deliver a message that the child that they've raised needs to be with Christ in heaven 
And, and the only way to deliver that child to Christ in heaven would be to smother the child. Well, I think we could agree that that would be a problem. Yes. And I mean, there's no, there's, there's no, uh, obviously, there are religious psychopathologies. Mm -hmm. They're well documented in the clinical literature. I mean, you see religious delusions in schizophrenia. You see religious delusions in manic depressive disorder. To the degree that it's an instinct, and it does seem to be an instinct, which is also something I don't think the atheists really grapple with, it's right. something that can go wrong, like most biological phenomena, let's say. Mm -hmm. And your, your, your objection points to a deeper problem, which is the, the problem of validation. Like if you have a revelation, the question is, how do you discern the evil spirits from the good? It's a classical religious problem sure. in some sense. And, it, and it's not a trivial problem. It's a, it's a true problem. And it's a philosophical problem and a practical problem as well. That doesn't mean it can't be done. But, but uh, yeah. Uh, but I don't think that that in and of itself is a fundamental objection, let's say, to the religious instinct any more than the fact that there are pathologies of perception or pathologies of sensation that go along with those instincts as well. Mm -hmm. So how far do, do your particular belief systems go um, when, when you think about God? I mean, do you, do you believe in a literal creator or is, is this more of a metaphor to you? as far as how the cosmos... Well, I'm not be. sure where metaphor touches reality. Right. Like metaphor is an extraordinarily powerful tool for dealing with reality. And it isn't obvious to me that our reality isn't a lot more metaphorical than we think it is. Like I'm much less convinced that our standard scientific viewpoint, let's say the Enlightenment scientific viewpoint, is in any means complete. I don't really believe it is. I think that what we don't understand about the universe is, is vast in its expanse. For example, we don't understand consciousness, not even a bit. And people have been hitting consciousness pretty hard from a scientific perspective in the psychological and biological community for about 35, 40 years. And I don't really think they've got anywhere with it. Though I've read a couple of books that I thought were reasonably good. I read one called The User Illusion, which I thought was good. Jeffrey Gray had a pretty good book on consciousness. I didn't like Daniel Dennett's book at all. I think it was, as his critics said, consciousness explained away. There's lots of other things we don't... We also don't really understand the problem of the observer. Like, t like phenomena, extant phenomena, seem dependent in some strange sense. And this is without having to make any allusions to the mysteries of quantum physics, which is always a dangerous thing to do. Extant phenomena seem to require a subject, a conscious subject, in order to have any describable existence. And that's another thing that we don't really know what to make of. And so I think there are... And so you were asking me about my beliefs. I've spent a lot of time studying religious stories. Stories, period. But if you study stories deeply enough, first of all, we think in stories. Okay. We, we organize our lives in stories. We organize our perceptions with stories. There's no escaping from them. And stories have a structure. And the structure has a grammar. And you can tell that because you can tell the difference between something that's a story and something that isn't. Even though there's a diverse, diverse range of stories. There's something about the, the set of all stories that makes them stories. And when you look at what makes the set of all stories stories, you're in the religious fundament. That's what you're in. And the religious stories are, they're meta-stories. That's one way of thinking about it. So the hero myth is a very good example of that. And the hero myth, the hero myth is true insofar as human beings are true. Now, when I talked to Sam Harris, we augured in on the definition of truth, but I think Harris was wrong. He was after me because I refused to use true in the same manner that scientists use it. But true is a much older word than scientifically true. There's the true of an arrow's flight, and there's the true of your heart, and there's the true of your aim, and there's the true of metal, and like true is a very, very richly connotated word. And the hero myth, which is the idea that you should voluntarily confront the unknown despite your vulnerability, and that that will lead you to redemption, let's say, because that's how you would phrase it religiously, that's true. It's as true as anything we know. It might be more true than anything we know. 
And that's a strange thing because that's an indication of where metaphor, because the hero myth is a metaphor, that's a place where the metaphorical touches the real. And I don't think we understand that at all. And I don't think the atheist community... The thing that bothers me, I would say, about the... Let's call them the celebrity atheists, is that, as far as I can tell, they've never read any of the people... They've never read any of the people who would give them a real run for their money. Like, if you're going to play in this domain, you have to read Dostoevsky. It's not optional. You have to read Tolstoy. That's not optional either. You should read Mircea Eliade, the... the um, was he Romanian? I think he was Romanian. Romanian, yeah. Yeah, yes. and who, who, the scholar of religion, who's, who's a genius, and who wrote like 20 books, and including a history of religious ideas, which is an absolutely profound set of volumes. You should read Eric Neumann, who wrote The Great Mother and the Origins and History of Consciousness. And you should read Jung, and he has about 20 volumes, not counting his seminars. And I don't, or, and you should read Nietzsche as well, and that's just a good starting place, you know. And it isn't obvious to me that the celebrity atheist types have done their damn homework. These people were smart. Like, I've read a lot, and I've read a lot of science. Thousands of papers and hundreds of books, and they weren't easy books. I know when something's well written, and when the person's reading it, who's writing it, is above and beyond the ordinary in terms of their intellectual ability. And Jung, for example, was an incalculable genius. He was as smart as Nietzsche, maybe smarter, and that's, that's pretty much as high as it goes. And if you don't know that literature, you don't know what you're talking about. It's as simple as that. And if you don't know what you're talking about, then, well, like Dawkins, for example, is very well armed on the evolutionary side, on the evolutionary biology side. But he, he, he treats Christianity, for example, as if, it's, as if the highest forms of Christian thought are encapsulated in fundamentalist, like American, U.S., American fundamentalist Christianity. Well, that's just palpably absurd. So it, he's not, that's a straw man problem. And this is a big problem, the straw man problem. So, and there's another problem too, which is, as far as I can tell, the fundamental presuppositions of our culture are metaphysical. So for example, the notion of natural right, right? The notion of natural right is predicated on the idea that there's something intrinsically valuable about each human being, metaphysically valuable, let's say. And there's no evidence for that as a factual statement, right? Factually, we're all unbelievably diverse and different, and perhaps there's no reason to treat a human being any different than you'd treat a rat, let's say. The animal rights activists have made that case. Well, but we have these metaphysical presuppositions at the base of our culture. The, the doctrine of human rights, for example, that's predicated on the idea of intrinsic human value, and that's fundamentally embedded in a religious context. That grew out of Judeo-Christianity. And the thing is, is that, A, it's really functional. Societies that believe that and act it out, which is the best indication of belief, they really work. Societies that don't believe that get tribal and murderous pretty damn fast. And then you can also look at people's behavior, like if you're having a conversation with a committed atheist and you don't treat them as if they're a divine locale of consciousness engaged in the heroic myth, then all they're going to do is get irritated and angry and not even notice that. So I would say, well, they say they don't believe, but they act as if they believe. So, and for me, it's action. So when people say, well, do you believe in God? I think, well, what the hell do you mean by that? Like, what? That's a really complicated question. And for me, it's like, well, actions speak louder than words. And, and, and that's, I suppose, an existentialist perspective to some degree, that belief is best re reflected in action. But I think the, the, the celebrity atheist types, you know, they believe that the West and its humanistic presuppositions are a consequence of the Enlightenment. And that also staggers me because someone like Dawkins, for example, and Harris to a, to a lesser degree, they pride themselves on their evolutionary approach. It's like, okay, fine, let's play that game. How long ago was the Enlightenment? 500 years. Who cares? How long has, have human beings had a religious instinct? 150,000 years? 300,000 years? As far back as language, we don't know, maybe as far back as the creation of fire or the, the, the taming of fire, which would be some millions of years. We don't know. There's a religious instinct. It's a human universal. It's like, you're going to take that seriously? Or you're going to hand wave about the fact that our ethics were derived 500 years ago? When, when none of the scientific evidence suggests that. There's evidence for the emergence of ethic-like behavior in chimpanzees and wolves and rats and all sorts of animals. It's like, what, their enlightenment? That's grounded in the enlightenment as well? It's not serious, this stuff.
And it's, it's not good because it needs to be taken seriously. Right. So I, I hear most of that. If someone is to claim that a God has created the cosmos, should that not be tested? Isn't that a scientific claim that can be tested? You can construe it as a scientific claim, but the, the claim, let, let's, let's make it more concrete. Let's take sure. the biblical claim. The Bible is a series of stories. And then the question is, well, how do you interpret a story? And the answer is, with great difficulty. And here's why. A story consists of words, single words, and each word is in a phrase. So the word has to be interpreted within the confine of the phrase. And the phrase in the sentence, and the sentence in the paragraph, and the, and the paragraph in the chapter, and then the chapter in the sequence of chapters, and all the sequence of chapters in the entire corpus. But that, that doesn't exhaust the problem with regards to, say, Christianity, because there's a huge extra-biblical context within which all of that is interpreted as well. So trying to point to a sentence and saying, here's what that means, is like, they're not, it's not a set of propositions, like a sequence of scientific hypotheses. So to say that it should be tested in the same way mixes two modalities of thought. My preference is to try to understand what the claim means. So the claim means something like, as far as I can tell, so if you look at the opening of Genesis, for example, that consciousness gives rise to, to being as a consequence of the confrontation with potential. That's the idea. Is that, so the way that that's stated in a narrative sense is that God, whatever God is, uses the word, which is an unbelievably complex co concept. I don't think there is a more complex concept, psychologically speaking or philosophically speaking, that I've ever encountered than the idea of the word. But God right. uses the word to extract habitable order out of a pre-existent potential. And human beings are made in that image. I think, yeah, there, there's something about that that's right. Because what our consciousness does, as far as I can tell, we're not determined like clocks, as, as Harris would have it, for example. I don't think that that's accurate at all. I think what we do is confront something like an, an infinite potential in a, in a constrained manner, because we're constrained creatures, is we confront the infinite potential of the future. And we use our consciousness to make decisions and cast that potential into reality. And what the opening of Genesis is making reference to, and, and this isn't only true of Genesis, by the way, this is true of many cosmogonic myths, is that there's some integral relationship between the unknown, so that would be potential, consciousness, which is the thing that encounters potential and casts it into order, into reality, and reality and order itself. And those are like the three fundamental constituent elements of reality. So the mytho for the mythological, see, in the mythological world, the world isn't made out of things. And, and, you know, the world really isn't made out of things. So, the, the, the Democritus, who, who formulated the atomic hypothesis, the Greek, he said that things, reality, was made out of atoms and space. Now, the space part actually turns out to be really important, because the materialists tend to think of things as made of atoms. And say, well, everything's made of atoms. It's like, yeah, yeah, just wait a second. That's not exactly right. They're made out of atoms and space. And the thing about space is that it allows the atoms to be arranged in patterns. And then the patterns have their own reality. You're a musician. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what music expresses. So each note is an atom. But the notes aren't isolated phenomena. They're woven into these complex, this complex interplay of patterns. And that's an analogy of, the, of reality, which is why music speaks so deeply to people. And so music has this, or the reality, like music, has this intensely multi, multiple layer patterned nature. And that patterned nature is not something that's easily reducible to a pure deterministic atomic perspective. It doesn't work. And it's not even real because the world is really made out of patterns. And so the mythological world tries to take the fact of the patterns into account. That's one way of looking at it. See, you, you, today, when we were talking just before this mm -hmm. podcast, you said that if you had to pick something you believed in, let's say you'd believe in music. Yeah. And see, that's a very interesting thing, because music is a, is a metaphysical representation of sorts, a metaphoric representation. That's another way of thinking about it. And it produces the intimation of deep meaning, which is why, and, and speaks to virtually everyone, right? Even cynics. 
And the reason music does that is because it, it presents the unfolding of being as the harmonious interplay between patterns, but also requires the listener and the meaning that emerges as a consequence of you confronting those patterns, that meaning, that's, that's the instinct for meaning. And that's also the thing that's facilitated in, I would say, the deepest of religious thought. Because the religious thinkers, the truly religious thinkers would say, try to maintain yourself in that space of entrancement by meaning that is indicated to you by music. Because the arts, of course, point the way, as, mm -hmm. as everyone has always known, I would say. So, anyways, again, I would say in the, in the celebrity atheist community, such things are not taken with due seriousness. And I think that's a real problem. And, and I think uh, I see a way, without having to go to religion um, or to belief in God, where art can fulfill that need that we have. And, and I think... Um, the same pleasure that can uh, be acquired from uh, religious belief, I believe we can get that kind of artistic inspiration from well, art. Well, the question is there that, see, I would say in some sense that's the last... Look, we could say that there's all sorts of different religious phenomena, and some of them are articulated as explicit beliefs. And those are the ones that are most amenable to rational criticism and the most likely to expire because of that. But then there's other religious phenomena that are much more difficult to tear apart rationally. Ritual, dance, art, music, beauty, and all of those things have been used, for example, inside cathedrals, in other religious mm -hmm. ceremonies, yeah. to heighten the religious sense. The artistic world is a pointer to the to the religious world. Now, if you're rationalistic and you've criticized your explicit religious beliefs out of existence, perhaps for valid reasons, you're going to default to the pre-verbal manifestation of the same impulse. And it's much more ineradicable, which I think is partly why music has become such a dominant force in our culture, is the religious, we, we require religious grounding. Without it, you're hopeless. By definition, because what you need to not be hopeless is meaning. And some things speak to you in a meaningful way. Now, you may say, well, I can't get the meaning from the explicit statements of religion. My, my rational mind criticizes those statements to death and leaves them not only dead for me, but even, I'm, it even makes me antipathetic towards them. But what will happen then is you'll fall down a level of abstraction into something like music or dance or art, if, if you're fortunate, if you have the temperament for that. Or, or perhaps you'll just fall into something like nihilism, which is a much more catastrophic consequence. I agree. But art and beauty and literature and music, they po they're pointers. They're pointers in some sense to a transcendent domain. That's why they have their power. And the, 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 the essence of that transcendent domain is the same. It's the ground from which religious notions spring. It's the same thing. So, you know, and if you look at this developmentally or say... Anthropo anthropologically, this is completely evident. Before our culture differentiated itself so extremely, dance and music and art and chanting and poetry, all of that was all integrated into one solid cultural form that was essentially religious in its nature. It's been fragmented and, and differentiated in our culture, which for better or for worse, but you don't have to trace it back very far until you see all of that as the unity that makes culture a reality. And it's, it's not the transmission of explicit statements of fact about the structure of the world. That isn't what makes up culture. Culture is something more like a musical dance that we all engage in. And again, I don't see that fact, since we like to talk about facts, mm -hmm. I don't see that fact being addressed seriously by the, by the uh, celebrity atheist types. Right. They tend to write that off. Music, it's an epiphenomenon. It's like, no, actually, it's not. That's just wrong. You can't even understand language properly unless you can understand music because music has a language has a musical element. So, yeah, and I see, um, uh, I get the concept of art being pointers now, and and I and I understand the religiosity of music and 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 how how that feels being a part. Of, you know, you hear that 
that song at the right time, your favorite song live with other people, and you get that charge. And I get that. Yeah, feeling. that's the thing, that charge. So, thing. so I get that aspect. Mm-hmm. But where I always kind of laugh out loud is once a, a supernatural being of some kind or a god is then implemented because mm-hmm. I don't see a need for an idol like that. Well, like I said, you don't want to be simple-minded about these sorts of things. Like, once you've got to the point... When I, when I listen to Dawkins talk, for example, about religion and, and his criticisms of fundamentalism, I think, well, you've dipped your toe in the ocean. It's like, yeah, okay, you've got the obvious criticisms right. But you haven't started to grapple with the real questions. Like, that, f- that sense that grips you, let's say, when you're playing music, that, that's a really mm-hmm. good example. Yeah. Here's a question. Just what the hell's going on? Like, so imagine what you're doing, eh? Like when you're, when you're let's say you're, you're improvising with a bunch of people. Mm-hmm. So first of all, weirdly enough, you can do it on the fly. And it's really complicated. So you're generating these patterns on the fly, right? And you're really into it. It grips you. It grips your whole body. If you start to think about it consciously, you'll screw up, right? It's it has true, to yes. flow. It, it's not a left brain activity, technically speaking. It's a right brain activity. It has to flow. So your whole body, you have to be embodied in the music. And you have to participate in that process of having the patterns unfold. But interestingly enough, you can do that with a bunch of other people at the same time. You can get on the same wavelength. And there's something really entrancing about that entrainment, right? And then the whole audience can participate in that. And that's when the joint gets rocking, right? And everyone's thrilled about that. They're all moving together, right? And that moving together, that's a primary cultural phenomena. What you want in your culture is for people to move together. And you know that music grounds culture. Like, people have their subcultures that are based in music. Well, that's because music, since time immemorial, has been used to cement people together, to have them move together, and to occupy the same pattern space as, a, as the substructure of the culture within, culture within which they're embedded. And to ignore the primary religious nature of that, or to confuse that, to ignore the primary religious nature of that, because you can say... Here's some explicit statements that some religions have made that I can criticize rationally is to be blind to the much more profound relationship between the meaning evoked by such rituals, let's say, and the primary religious impulse. And that's the other thing is that there's no doubt that the religious experience is part and parcel of human biology. It's not a secondary cultural overlay. First of all, it can be elicited in all sorts of ways, and I think the most obvious one is through art and music. But it can certainly be elicited reliably by pharmacological agents. And it can be induced by all sorts of different rituals, fasting and chanting and dancing and and sensory deprivation and dreaming and trance states and vision. There's lots of ways for it to be induced, even electromagnetically now. It's like, okay, what is that exactly? Well, the... The biologist, atheist types say, well, it's an epiphenomena. It's like, yeah, yeah. You can't describe something as a spandrel or an epiphenomena unless you have a theory of its existence. You can't just dismiss it. Human religious sentiment and belief, for that matter, is a human universal. There's no hand-waving it away any more than you can hand-wave away the human proclivity for language. You have to contend with it. And we don't contend with it. And it's much deeper than that. Like, I've just barely scraped, I've just barely touched the surface here. You know, because the the primary religious impulse, which I would say is the impulse to the experience of meaning, is actually a marker. It's an extension of a very fundamental instinct, the orienting reflex. Very fundamental instinct towards the unknown, which automatically orients you towards the unknown. It's the instinct of meaning. And we also tend to think of meaning as epiphenomenal, although there were philosophers who didn't, like Heidegger, for example, who thought that meaning was the primary phenomena and made a very strong case for it. Meaning is the instinct that tells you that you're sufficiently secure and sufficiently exploring at the same time. It's a deep instinct, and it places you in the right place at the right time. And there's something of religious significance about that from the experienced state. But I also think there might be something significant of it far beyond that. Well, those are other things that we don't have serious conversations about. Right. So beyond that being what? 
well, who knows what you can accomplish if you're in the right place at the right time. Like, we have no idea what the upper limits of human ability are. Right. Like, you know, you know perfectly well that there's a difference between how catastrophic your life goes when you let everything go to hell. It's bad for you. It's bad for your family. It's bad for the community. It can really be bad. You can make things really, really bad. Well, you can also make them really, really good. And you know, you think, well, what difference does it make? We're all dead in a million years, which is a hell of a way to think about things, you know? But I don't know what difference it makes if we order things. We're the only conscious sl slash self-conscious beings that we know. We're the most complicated things in creation, in the cosmos, as far as we know. Who knows what the significance of us getting ourselves together is? And I'm not willing to buy the party line of, you know, we're dust motes on another dust moat in a meaningless cosmos. It's like, no, sorry, I've seen where that line of reasoning goes. I don't think I want to go there. It leads to a nihilistic worldview. And, and, and you don't stop with nihilism. That's just the starting point for a very terrible descent. So I think it's much more accurate to think, and this is the story that's laid out in the corpus of the biblical stories, that human beings... The capacity that human beings have for creative consciousness is best regarded as divine and as part of the divine essence of, the, of, the, of, the, of being. And that we have a primary moral obligation to manifest that consciousness in the best of all possible manners and bring the best of all possible worlds into being. And I don't see that as merely epiphenomenal. I see it as central to the nature of reality. So, right. Okay, I, I, I think um, we should quickly talk about um, selfauthoring.com. Um, you're running a two-for-one promotion right now, and for the listeners, can you give a brief descrip description of what self-authoring is and why it's important? Well, you can either be someone to whom things happen, which I wouldn't recommend, or you can be someone who takes an active role in determining your own destiny. I was just reading the audio version of my first book today, recording at Maps of Meaning, and there's an ancient god in there, Marduk, who's a hero god who confronts the dragon of chaos and makes the world out of the combat, uh, as a consequence of the combat. And he's the determiner of destinies. That's how he's construed. And that's really what you want to be in your own life. It's like you do confront an infinite sea of potential. Some of that's past. Because the past isn't as fixed as you think it is, because you don't understand it completely. Some of it's present, who you are right now, and some of it's future, who you could be. And your best bet, and this is a mythological idea, is to take conscious and voluntary control over the fact that you're out there sailing on, sailing on the sea. And that you can, you can identify a star that can guide you, that's the, your vision for who you could be, and you can articulate out what it is that you want from your life. And you can chart your course towards that. And we've used the future authoring program in particular with university students and with men, for example. It, it seems to work better for men, especially men who aren't doing very well, strangely enough. And there's complicated reasons for that. We found at Mohawk College, for example, is that... There a, sorry, is there a lack of reflection in, in men in general? No, I is just that... think men won't do anything unless they have a reason. Right. Their own reason. Because they're not very agreeable. So if a man hasn't charted his course, he's just going to not do anything. Right. Because why do anything? Doing things is actually hard. So you need a reason. You need a real reason. And maybe you need a reason that reaches right down into the depths of your soul. Because there's plenty of things to overcome. Like if you don't have a real reason, someone will just push you over. And so and then you'll default to like more impulsive forms of gratification. You know, video game. I don't have anything against video games, by the way. But, you know, they shouldn't be your whole life. You're not out there in the adventure of the world. Well, you need to be. And the Future Authoring Program helps you develop a personal vision, I would say, of heaven and hell. Of where you could be in three to five years if everything went the way it should, if you were taking care of yourself. Contrasted with the awful and dismal dwelling place you might manage if you let all your bad behaviors and bad habits take the upper hand. So you develop a vision first and then lay out a strategy. And if you, if you have college students do this, especially if they're men, especially if they're not doing very well, if they hadn't done very well in high school, especially if they're not in a program that's directed towards a specific pr professional end, so it's kind of ill-defined, ill it increases the probability that they'll stay in school by 
And 50%, like that's just, it's just an overwhelming amount. And I think the reason is, why do anything? Right? The default is to sit and not do. Well, that's misery, man. That's misery. So you need to do something. And in the future authoring program, you're encouraged to, well, you're encouraged, first of all, to take courage. But more specifically, you're encouraged to treat yourself like someone you have a moral obligation to do well for. That's not self-esteem or self-liking or anything like that. It's an obligation. Like you're a, you're a valuable being among other valuable beings and you should do everything you can to foster your What would you say? You should do everything you can to become everything you can. Just to find out what you might be like. There's an adventure for you. Well, if you do that, then things get better. And I've had thousands and thousands of letters from people now. Tens of thousands of letters saying exactly that. People have written and said, look, I've decided to start treating myself properly. I was in a dark place. It wasn't good for all sorts of the reasons that people get into dark places. I've made a goal. I've developed a vision. I've made a goal. I'm trying to be responsible. I'm taking, I'm disciplining myself and I'm trying to tell the truth and things are way better. It's like, yeah, yeah, absolutely. See how good you can make them. There's an adventure for your life. Life is terrible. It's full of suffering and malevolence and betrayal and everything, everything terrible that human beings can do to one another, plus everything terrible that the planet can do to you. That's the baseline condition of existence. Well, what you're charged to do is to move forward in, in spite of that and to make everything you can as good as it can possibly be. Well, that'll get you out of bed in the morning. And you need a reason for that. And I think that's especially true if you're a man. You need a voluntary reason. I think with women, the situation is different because they've already kind of got their hands full. Obviously, especially now in, in the modern West, they're out pursuing careers and everyone's encouraging that. And that's like a new adventure in some sense. But they also have the fact of childcare and, 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 and child rearing and pregnancy and all of that to deal with. So their destiny, in some sense, is perhaps it doesn't need to be crafted in quite exactly the same manner. Or perhaps it's not as possible for women to be as useless as it's possible for men to be. Because men can be spectacularly useful, but they can also be spectacularly useless. Whereas with women, it's more like the default is utility. And, and I think that's also true biologically, because what you see, especially in sexually dimorphic species like human beings, we're not that dimorphic, but we're somewhat dimorphic, is that the range of utility of the males is wider than the range of utility of the females. And so that means there's more useless males and more hyper-useful males, and whereas the females tend to be crushed more into the middle of the distribution. Okay, the radical right. The Nazis. Bad news, right? Okay, everyone agrees on that. Yeah. The radical left. Bad news, right? 100 million corpses, something like that? Okay. How do you know when you've become too radical on the left? The answer is, we don't know. Well, no, sorry, wrong answer. So the radical leftists have plenty of house to sort out before they start making pronouncements about biological reality. They refuse to do it because they won't take on the moral responsibility of determining when their hypothetically compassion-based morality has gone too far. So, I've got no liking whatsoever for the radical leftists. I think they're as reprehensible as the Nazis, except that the Nazis at least have identified themselves. You know who the hell they are. And they can come out and parade around as dramatically evil and accept that. Whereas the radical leftists still wear this cloak of compassion despite the fact that they're philosophical precursors killed a hundred million people. It's like, so, you know, their pronouncements on gender theory, it's like, it's an indication of the absolute corruption of the universities. There's right. no excuse for it. The evidence that human beings are sexually dimorphic, physiologically, psychophysiologically -physi dimorphic, is absolutely overwhelming. No reasonable biologist di disputes the fact that there are, on average, differences between men and women. Differences that, if you add them up, are enough to segregate the genders, the sexes, completely. That's, that's not pseudoscience. It's not the opinion of some extremists. The only people who don't believe that are not-headed social constructionists who've been raised on a diet of, like, Judith Butler and Foucault. Right. So. 
All right. Well, I would love to do this forever, but we got to get you on stage in a couple minutes. Thank you so much for taking the time. Um, this has been the Penguin Philosophy Podcast with Jordan Peterson, and let art and science inspire. Today, I'm speaking with Dinesh D'Souza. He is a best-selling author and filmmaker. His films, 2016 Obama's America and America Imagine a World Without Her, are respectively the number two and number six highest rated political documentaries of all time. D'Souza's latest feature length film, Hillary's America, is widely credited with contributing to Hillary Clinton's defeat in 2016 and quickly joined his first two films in the top 10 political documentaries of all time. D'Souza's latest film, Death of a Nation, builds on this success and takes on, quote, progressive big lies, finally proving once and for all that the real party of fascism and racism is now and has always been the Democratic Party. Them's fighting words from a feisty man. Thanks for coming on uh, today, Dinesh. Uh, hey, it's great. It's good to be on the show. Awesome. So has the response to uh, Death of a Nation lived up to your expectations? Uh, it has. We have, um, you know, we uh, the movie's been successful in the theater. It comes out in DVD very shortly. And, um, you know, part of what I'm doing is contesting, I call them meta stories, which is large narratives about America uh, and about society that have become embedded in our public discourse. Uh, the problem is that most people take these narratives to be fact, whereas in fact they are the product of a progressive ideology uh, that became predominant after World War II. So the textbooks are written by the progressives. These ideas are then refracted through the media and through Hollywood. And since people get them from all directions, they figure they've got to be true. And what I'm doing is contesting those narratives. Uh, and I do this both on the political, but also on the cultural and theological fronts. Right. And uh, would you say Hollywood is a bigger player in this or, or the media? How would you uh, kind of quantify that? Well, uh, they all perform a different function. Academia is the factory for, you may say, manufacturing these narratives and, and supplying them with their scholarly respectability. Uh, the media then pushes them out in a kind of, uh, it, through commentary, uh, through the History Channel, through NPR, National public radio. Uh, Hollywood converts these uh, stories into narratives, into feature films. Uh, and so what happens is ultimately what concerns me is this is a formulating people's opinion by cultivating prejudices, by giving people an idea that certain things must be true, uh, even though the ordinary guy has no opportunity to actually skeptically scrutinize the basis for these claims. Uh, so these claims of things like fascism is on the right or the Republican Party is the party of racism. Um, and, um, uh, and then uh, uh, these narratives, as I say, become embedded in the brain because you, you see them, you hear them in college, you see them in Barnes & Noble, you turn on the History Channel, there it is. And so you think you know it, but you don't know it because you don't actually know how that idea came to be. What is the actual support for it? That's, that's what my movies contest. Uh, and look, I mean, I write the books and the movies because I'm using the same sort of, you may say, double whammy. Uh, I put my references in the books, but then I depict and dramatize the story through film. Right. And uh, I, I'm glad you brought up skepticism. There seems to be a, a massive failure, failure across the board in teaching skepticism to children. Is this, is this something you think is important uh, for, for young kids? Uh, absolutely. And, and by the way, I think that skepticism is should equally be the furniture uh, of the uh, well, first of all, I think it should be the furniture of the political right as well as the left. But second of all, I think it should also be the intellectual furniture of the believer, the religious believer, no less than of the unbeliever. Um, in fact, the reason we talk about religious belief as opposed to knowledge uh, is because when you believe something to be true, you don't know it's true. Uh, you believe it, uh, and you have to have some basis for believing it. So um, I once had a debate with uh, Michael Shermer uh, from Skeptic Magazine, and I told him, I'm a skeptic no less than you. I'm an agnostic no less than you, in the sense that both of us don't know. Uh, we haven't been to the other side of the curtain. We don't know what comes after death. Uh, we're both, in, in a sense, groping in the dark and using the, the candlelight of our intellect and our experience uh, to try to make sense of something that it's inherently impossible to know for sure. Right. Um, it, now, just touching on that for a bit, if if there is something that we cannot know for sure, aren't there um, better ways to go about uh, coming up with a probability of what uh, probably is? 
No. Uh, in other words, yes and no. Uh, let's put it this way. If you if you were to tell me that there are two headed people living in Papua New Guinea, uh, we know right away uh, that there is a mechanism for checking, even if us if the two of us don't go. Uh, we can listen to other people give us travel reports and so on, and we can as attach a certain degree of probability. But that is based on our experiential knowledge of who those people are. Uh, the problem is is that many questions in life aren't like that. Uh, so for example, you know, how did we get the world? Uh, or I mentioned earlier, what comes after death? Now think about how idiotic it is for some, someone to assign probabilities to something where experience doesn't reach at all. Um, uh, th there is no way to assign those probabilities. Um, uh, you know, earlier in earlier generations, people tried to apply what they thought was a skeptical intellect uh, they would say things, for example, that, you know, we have seen millions of white swans uh, all over Europe and therefore all swans are white because every iota of European experience uh, confirms that swans are white. Uh, then you set foot on the shores of uh, Australia and you see the first black swan and suddenly the, your whole, you know, confirmed idea that all swans are white is shot. Why? Because here was something outside the narrow parameters of your experience. The fact that you didn't know it was there didn't mean it wasn't there. And your uh, your haste in attaching probabilities to something to which those probabilities don't apply uh, ends up only, uh, you may say, fortifying your ignorance. Right. And, uh, and so you assert as a law something that is not a law. Right. So that's not a law. So that's so we have to recognize that 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 applies to our world too, uh, no less to the, than to the world of the ancient Greeks. Just because all their experience confirmed that there were a handful of stars in the sky didn't mean that they were actually correct about that experience. Right. So so I guess taking that all into consideration, if someone was to uh, make the claim. Um, do you believe that an afterlife exists, you would respond, I don't know? Yes, I would respond, I don't know. Now, I would respond that, that um, in, in, in fact, none of us knows. Uh, we haven't been to the other side of the curtain. So we would have to be to try to figure out uh, whether or not there is, first of all, the possibility of an afterlife. We would have to look at arguments from philosophy, from experience, near-death experiences, which may be the closest experiential clue uh, to see if there is any possibility of, of consciousness surviving when the body does not. Um, and we'd have to, um, uh, we'd have to look at uh, findings in modern physics and cosmology to see whether or not this concept of a uh, an alternative universe, you might say, because after all, what is at least the Christian concept of the afterlife is an alternative universe. It is another realm uh, outside, you may say, or transcending the realm of our universe in which other laws apply. Uh, and uh, I would argue that modern cosmology has actually opened up this possibility, which wasn't there before. Right. So as a skeptic, I would I would agree with you to say I don't know uh, if someone asks me if there is an afterlife. Um, <clears throat> but I would never make a uh, any kind of positive claim and say that I or, or, or even say that I believe that an afterlife uh, does exist. So I, I guess maybe I connect my beliefs to, to what I claim to know a little more closely than you would. Well, let's let's test that, though, because Travis. I'll ask you this question. Do you believe in life on other planets? Um, do I believe in life in other planets? Uh, well, do you believe for example, that, that there could be, and maybe is, life in some other realm, some other planet, some other galaxy, some other star? Sure. Uh, you, do you believe that? Yeah, yeah. And the reason, and the reason for that is um, because, you know, we have examples of life existing on a planet here. Right. But what I'm saying is the fact that life exists here so far, as, as far as I can tell, there is no actual evidence uh, that there is life anywhere else. And so your belief that there is life somewhere else, you would have to admit, uh, is in that sense irrational. And by irrational, I mean that there's no there's no strong evidence that would actually point your brain in that direction. But nevertheless, you are open to the a possibility, perhaps you even consider it a, a probability. So here's the point I want to make, and it's a philosophical rather than a scientific point. Uh, Immanuel Kant, the philosopher, made the point that where reason cannot go, it is not irrational to have faith. In other words, if if we don't have a way of knowing whether there's life or death, life or not after death, it is no more reasonable to say that there is than there isn't, you, because you can't assign a probability based on reason. So the skeptic who says 
There's no life after death who thinks that he's being somehow more rational than I am. He's not. He's he's deluded about the extent of where reason can travel. And, and here Kant's point applies, that before we have an argument based on reason, we have to demarcate the actual bounds of reason itself. Right. I think the skeptic who's making a positive claim saying that there is no afterlife, you know, is adopting the burden of proof. And uh, I, I think that's a very slippery slope to go down uh, when we, we cannot right. test the, this thing. Exactly. And I think this is my argument with people like Dawkins and Dennett and so on, is that they, they believe that their profession of faith in a, in a non-existence, you may say, of an afterlife is sort of more rational uh, than the believer who says, I believe in life after death. They think that they're applying reason and we're not. And I'm simply saying, what reason are you applying? What evidence is you supplying for your position that is any stronger than the evidence I'm supplying for mine? Yeah, I, I think I think a, a counter argument to that. I mean, my my definition of faith typically is believing something when when there's absent of any good reason to believe it. Is is am I just failing to define that properly? Well, uh, I would say this, that uh, when it is possible to know or where, where evidence applies, we should absolutely use evidence. But even in ordinary life, in virtually you know, many, if not most of our decisions, we can apply evidence to a point. Uh, and beyond that, there is an element of faith. I mean, think of something as simple as, you know, choosing the woman that you're going to marry. You're obviously going to plug in all the evidence you have about your life together, uh, your dating experience, what her character is like, uh, what the possibilities as best as you can envision them are going to be over the next, let's say, 30 years or more. But you have no way to know, in part because she's not going to be the same person 15 or 20 years from now than she is today. There's no way on a, on a rational basis to settle the matter. There's going to be a leap of faith. And everybody knows this. Um, and, and we take that leap of faith in, in all kinds of context. Somehow when it comes to religion, we somehow think it's different. And when we don't have proof, we should somehow not come to a conclusion. Uh, I, I think that the mathematician and philosopher Pascal was right. Most of life is lived in some sense in the void. Most of life involves applying scraps of reason and taking leaps of faith. And this is particularly true when you're talking about life lived forward, as opposed to life simply viewed in the rearview mirror. Yeah, I mean, I would... When looking at relationship, I feel like we build like kind of a, a scientific model in a sense when we when we decide who we're going to uh, to hook up with or, or get together with or marry and uh, and you know how much faith plays into that I I don't know like I guess you know I'm just speaking from my own experience I'll I'll do these calculations and see see how it feels and I don't ever you know know if uh, before I marry someone say that things are going to work out I'm basically just going through the process of being in a relationship so I'm not sure that I'm applying any faith at all because I wouldn't make the claim that you know we're going to be together forever or, or something like that well but you used a very telling phrase you said I see how it feels and I think what you're saying in effect is that when you let's say you made a chart and you put in her intelligence and you put in what you know about her character, you made a sort of equation or calculus about this. At the end of the day, you're going to ask a different set of questions, things like, can I imagine life without this person? Or do I have a certain intuition that we connect at a certain level? Now, remember that those things are tapping into deep veins of intuition and feeling, which fall a little outside the bounds of pure rationality, at least rationality is applied in any systematic way. And that's all I'm trying to say. I think the same things apply in religious belief that ultimately people, you know, there's no religious person, for example, who doesn't have a deep intuitive sense uh, that there is a God, who doesn't actually feel that they experience God in their ordinary life. So it is this experience attached to rationality that produces religious conviction that's all it's no different than than any other sphere of life mm, interesting so let's uh let's jump back to um so do you believe that the democratic party is still the party of slavery of course not uh, the Democratic Party is still the party, I say, of the plantation. Uh, but what I mean by that is that the Democrats today have. See, let's remember that slave, the slave plantation was an ethnic 
fake plantation. It wasn't just a bunch of guys enslaving a bunch of other guys. Uh, it was a bunch of white guys, for the most part, ensla enslaving an exclusive population of black guys. So it was an ethnic plantation based upon dependency and based upon there's nowhere else to go. You're, in a sense, locked into this life, way of life. Uh, and uh, the slave master provides all your needs. Now, I would argue today that that plantation philosophy remains and the Democrats are running, you may call them multicultural plantations, uh, ghettos for blacks, barrios for Latinos, reservations for Native Americans. So it's a different system than it was in the 1820s, but there is a thread of continuity. You still have ethnic groups that are essentially deposited into communities. Uh, they are still dependent on the Democratic Party for their livelihood. They are in a certain sense under mental rather than physical captivity. Uh, and, um, and the difference, of course, is that now it applies to many groups and not just to blacks. Right. And are, are the Republicans to blame for any level of, of racism in the history of the U.S.? Yes, although much less. In other words, I don't deny that racism became embedded in Western civilization starting uh, in the era of discovery. I've written widely about this in my book, The End of Racism, many years ago. I also don't deny that there was racism in the North and the South, in the Republican and in the Democratic Party. Lincoln had to contend with racism in the, in the, among Northern Republicans, for example. But there's simply no uh, comparison of magnitude. Uh, the Republican Party was the anti-racist party. It was the anti-slavery party. Um, and um, the, uh, it was the party of the 13, 14, and 15 amendments. It was the party that fought against the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, more Republicans voted for the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 65, the Fair Housing Bill of 68, uh, proportionally than Democrats did. So uh, my part of my point is that this history has been suppressed. It is not young. Some people don't know it. That's why when I talk about it on campus, they're blown away. They have to pull out their phone and check. Um, you know, the racist Dixiecrats did not become Republicans. The vast majority of them stayed and lived and died in the Democratic Party. So these are the kind of facts that I put in the movies. They're supported by documentation. Uh, and the only way to attack these arguments is to create straw men. Like I'm saying there's no racism in America. Or I'm saying that slavery is still going on. I don't say any of that nonsense. Uh, what I am saying, on the other hand, is that the, the, that the, the worst crimes of bigotry in this country, uh, not only slavery, but segregation, the founding and, and perpetuation of the Ku Klux Klan, lynching and racial terrorism, these were overwhelmingly poor, perpetrated by one political party, namely the Democratic Party, and that's a fact. Right. <clears throat> so you have recently been pardoned by President Trump, this was for pleading guilty to violating federal campaign finance laws in 2014. Uh, for those who don't know, uh, was this expected, this pardoning? Like, uh, d d like, d did you know that this was coming? Uh, yes and no. It was not expected in the sense that I was not an original, you may say, Trumpster. I, I didn't endorse Trump in the primaries. Uh, I made a movie critical of Hillary, and so I kind of came on board to support Trump as the Republican nominee once he got the nomination. Uh, Debbie, my wife, and I are actually close to Ted Cruz. Um, I now live in Texas. He's our senator. And uh, it was Ted Cruz who posed the question, asked Trump if he would consider pardoning me. And Trump said, um, uh, to actually quote Trump, uh, done. Uh, and so Trump is the one that did it, but uh, Cruz is the one who pressed him to do it. Right. Um... Great. And do you have do you have any kind of re relationship with uh, Donald Trump? Like, do you know him personally? None. What's no, I, I, I don't know him. I've never met him. I, I spoke to him once before the um, um, second debate that he had with Hillary. Uh, I was with a friend who's close to Trump and I was talking to them about questions that Trump could, could pitch to Hillary during the debate. And to my amazement, this guy pulled out his phone and called Trump uh, <laughs> and handed the phone to me. Wow. And so I got uh, five minutes to talk to Trump. And that was my only conversation with Trump prior to getting the, the sort of official phone call from the White House notifying me about the pardon. Right. Well, wow, that must have been something. Um, and uh, and how would you, if you were to give Trump a, a, your most serious critique of, of his presidency thus far, what what would that look like? Well, I mean, Trump is, um, uh, he, I think that he is a, um, a, a flawed man who is actually turning out to be a very good president. Um, it's, it's ironic because part of it is because of the time in which he is um, he's here. See, I think that there's been a gangsterization of the Democratic Party, um, and that's how we got Trump. Uh, Republicans nominated one Boy Scout after another, and 
and the Democrats were able to turn them into Lucifer in five minutes. A uh, perfect example is, uh, is Romney, uh, who t a very good man, but nevertheless a bit of an invertebrate. Uh, and the Democrats were able to demonize him. So the Republicans basically said, listen, you know, if that's the case, uh, then uh, maybe we need a tough guy to take on the kind of tough tactics that we've now become familiar with. We saw them again with Kavanaugh. Uh, again, a guy with a, a impeccable reputation, a lovely family, couldn't have a more uh, clean cut record. Uh, and there was a sort of effort to politically assassinate him. That's what I that's how I interpret this latest scandal. Um, it was essentially a fake a political hit uh, of the worst kind. Um, and uh, so, uh, you know, is Trump an egotist? Yes. Uh, does he have an irresistible tendency to want to hit back no, ma no matter how petty and picayune the person attacking him? Yes. But I think it's coming at a time when Republicans need that kind of feistiness. They need someone to hit back. Uh, and so I'm very glad we have Trump uh, doing it. None of the other Republicans would be able to do what he's doing right now. Well, it seemed like they couldn't even stand on stage with him when, when they were going through the, uh, the debates before the election. Like it just, he's, well, he's, a, yeah. he's a street fighter and uh, and he has that even though he's a billionaire, he has this kind of working class style. Uh, it's a New York style uh, and, and the wrong side of the tracks, New York style. And the Democrats aren't used to it. This is why he's thrown them off guard. So they are accustomed to handling a Republican like Pence. They're accustomed to handling the sort of a Republican like McCain. Uh, they know how to beat those people to a pulp. And when I say they, I don't just mean the Democratic Party. I mean the Democratic Party in coordination with Hollywood and the media. Uh, they know how to deal with the typical weak need Republican. Uh, but Trump is, is unmanageable. Uh, uh, and he's proven to be actually an extremely good street fighter. Uh, in fact, he uses the tactics of the left, which is ridicule, insult. Uh, he doesn't back down. Uh, uh, and uh, they're not used to being treated, given a dose of their own medicine. Right. Let's talk about Kavanaugh for a minute. I, I'm just going to start with your tweet that you sent out this morning. So you said, in retrospect, it's clear it was the media left that attempted to gang rape Kavanaugh. They sought to destroy his life, his dignity, and his reputation. He wasn't the perpetrator. He was the victim. Now, my follow-up question to that would be, uh, could Kavanaugh and Ford both be a victim here of this political shit slinging, essentially? Uh, that is a possibility, but it's not a probability. Uh, again, you know, let's come back to our let's weigh uh, evidence. And, and the weighing of evidence here uh, is not simply a matter of weighing Ford's word against Kavanaugh. Um, just for the same reason, reason um, that if somebody were to come out and say, you know, Albert Einstein faked his equations, uh, it's not simply a matter of he said, she said. Uh, we know Einstein. We actually would know his work. We would know his reputation. Uh, we would, he has, in a sense, proven himself over a long period of time with a long procession of, of, of witnesses, competent witnesses, uh, that he's worked with closely and so on. So here's the point. So that's the situation here. Here's a woman who comes out of nowhere. Um, right before the hearing, she scrubs all her social media, in a sense, a very, which requires a lot of skill to do. She wipes clean her record. She hires a couple of shady Democratic lawyers and is is working in close concert with the Democratic Party, strategic leaks and so on, uh, all targeted, quickly picked up by the, the right magazines and blown up. Uh, and so in weighing this, it, it, again, you have to apply a certain skeptical lens equally to Ford and Kavanaugh. And that, that never happened. The skepticism was applied in a one-way sense to Kavanaugh without applying the same investigations to Ford. Who looked at Ford's high school yearbook? Who looked to see what she was like? whether she had a reputation for truthfulness uh, uh, and so on. That was not done. So the, the basic idea is that Ford is not on trial. We shouldn't be doing this to Ford. She's merely the accuser. Uh, Kavanaugh's in, so the, 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 the hastiness of the Democrats in insisting that this is not a, a trial was a way of saying, let's not apply the normal rules of evidence. Let's not apply presumption of innocence. Let's not apply reciprocal skepticism. Uh, let's just basically assume that what she said is completely true. Uh, and even though there's absolutely no corroboration. Uh, you know, we created a almost bogus standards of corroboration. In other words, if you made the accusation yourself to your husband three years ago, uh, that's a confirmation that what you're saying is true. Uh, even though, again, you're the only source for it in, in, in that, that instance as well. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, that's interesting. Um, should should Kavanaugh um, should should there be legal repercussions for Ford if uh, like there sh- should there be a an investigation to see if there was uh, malice here and uh, and should you know should there be a um, some kind of charge? Well, you know, there's there's a high standard for um, for making a charge against Ford. The, these events are a long time ago. But on the other hand, I don't think that one should, with impunity, be able to uh, launch, you may say, a uh, an accusational missile that has the potential to completely destroy a man's life, uh, utterly unsupported. So the the reason for making an accusation would be if this is some kind of a left wing conspiracy. Uh, in other words, for if, if for example there was close targeted coordination uh, between Ford and her lawyers uh, and the Democrats. And if, for example, there was a um, an attempt to get Kavanaugh, whether or not. See, I, I did a thought experiment the other day. I thought to myself, what if Kavanaugh goes down? And what if a year from now, Ford comes out and says, hey, I made the whole thing up. I have to confess, I pulled a fast one. What would the left say? There's a reasonably good chance that what they would say is, go forward, fantastic. What a brilliant uh, civil uh, libertarian um, move. What a what a what an inspired tactical strike. So, in other words, what struck me about this whole episode was the complete indifference uh, to whether or not Ford's accusation was true. Even now, with Michael Avenatti, the only reason the Democrats are mad at Avenatti is because they feel that he might have made a tactical blunder in overstating charges of gang rape. He went too far. Not that his charges were false, but that they didn't work. Hmm. Interesting. Um, On November 29th in New York City, you'll be sitting down for a conversation with philosopher Matt Dillahunty, who is a prominent promoter of positive atheism and the separation of church and state. Matt was a fundamentalist Christian for 25 years and thought that he was supposed to be a preacher, but was able to find his way out of religion as he describes it. what do you expect to come of that conversation? Well, I expect it to be a, a rich, uh, textured, um, smart uh, conversation that is interdisciplinary, that draws on um, many different fields and draws on our experience. In a sense, my journey is the, the reverse of Matt's. I grew up in India. My uh, ancestors are converts to Christianity, but we practiced a, a very social, cosmetic type of Christianity. Uh, So I, um, you may say, discovered or rediscovered my faith uh, in adult life. Uh, And so I think it's going to be interesting to have two guys who are very uh, confident of of their beliefs, but uh, are on opposite sides, uh, engage in the kind of debate that has unfortunately become extremely rare in the um, I missed it myself. I did a series of, of debates with uh, Christopher Hitchens and, and some of the other atheists. I haven't done that in a while. So this is uh, my stepping back into the arena, looking forward to it. And um, I think it's going to be very lively. Great. Um, uh, do, you, do you like the fact that there is church-state separation in the U.S. Constitution, or would you change it if you had a chance? Well, I think the, the core of this is what we mean by church it's separation. I mean, the concept of separating, you may say, church or re- religion and government uh, is a deeply Christian idea. Uh, you know, what else is the meaning of Jesus saying, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's? What is the meaning of that if not that we have completely separate duties uh, to the state, i.e. Caesar, as we do uh, to God, to the religious domain. Um, there was a separation of, of church and state from the beginning of Christianity. Now, I agree that those lines became more frequently blurred, uh, but even in the Inquisition, if you were accused of a, uh, of a religious offense, you were tried by the church. If you were accused of a state offense, you were tried by the state. There were separate church courts, if you will, and state courts. And this is actually uh, an invention of Christianity. If you go to Islam, for example, you just don't have that. Uh, Sharia law applies equally to the domains of church and state. So part of what I want to bring to Matt, and I, you know, I don't know if, how this debate is going to go, uh, is, is a sort of a recognition uh, of the kind of ambiguity of these ideas that sort of if you say separation of church and state and you think you've come up with some brilliant enlightenment innovation that wasn't there in, Christ- in Christianity before, then you need a little bit of an historical education. Hmm. Interesting. Why, uh, I'll just come out and ask this question. Why do you believe in God? And if so, why not Apollo or Thor instead of Yahweh? 
the um, the arguments for um, uh, polytheism uh, were um, arguments for taking uh, I may almost say uh, aspects of uh, human nature uh, and magnifying them into gods not human nature but nature too and so for example you have the river god um, and uh, the god of lightning the god of thunder the god of the oceans and so on um, in that sense uh, gods functioned as you may say uh, special types of surrogates for human human beings um, and uh, and this is Partly why polytheism uh, collapsed when it was confronted by the challenge of monotheism, uh, it collapsed really all over the world. So that polytheism is not real today. We talk about Greek mythology, we can't take it seriously, even though the Greeks really did believe that there was a place called Mount Olympus somewhere on the earth uh, and that these gods did exist. We can't take that seriously today because because we can see very clearly that polytheism uh, is, you may say, a projection of human uh, attributes. Now, that's not true of monotheism. And you have these astounding claims, uh, for example, in, in the Bible, uh, in, the, in the book of Genesis, that God made the world. And not only did God make the world, but he made the world... Um, he created time along with the world. And think about that. This is an incredible statement that is made hundreds of years before Christ. Uh, and it's made by people with no access to any uh, scientific experiments whatsoever. The idea that time itself is a property of the universe. This is stated, um, not only stated in the Bible, but then affirmed by a tradition of Christian interpretation of the, uh, and, and Jewish interpretation of those verses. Um, and yet you would have to admit that this is a completely valid issue in modern cosmology. This is nothing that can be dismissed. We can't say, oh, gee, uh, you know, we've refuted that a long time ago. Well, that's just a bunch of nonsense. On the contrary, uh, that is an extremely counterintuitive statement, astounding and in inexplicable when it was made, that can actually be defended today with the best findings of modern astronomy, physics, and cosmology. Uh, and so anyway, my, the point is to me, uh, God is a reality in my life. The concept of God makes sense as an explanation for a universe that doesn't have any other explanation. Uh, and so to me, it's a confluence of arguments, historical, philosophical, and scientific, that support the idea of a creator. Right. So, so I agree that the stories are interesting, um, and you know, I'm a big fan of uh, all kinds of myths. Um, but uh, I've you know the 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 spot where I find hard to go to is um, that I mean the Bible the Bible for example was was written by human beings and um, who claimed to be divinely inspired and why why do people uh, trust that they were divinely inspired in the right way or that they were divinely inspired at all? They don't. In other words, look at the time of early Christianity, there were literally um, innumerable uh, texts, all purporting to be uh, divinely inspired. So it's not as if the Christian said, oh, gee, Fred, you say you're divinely inspired. Okay, you got to go in the Bible. Uh, that's nonsense. I mean, there was a, a deep process of examination that actually lasted 300 years. Um, the, the Bible as we know it um, and the, do the basic Christian doctrines as we know them uh, weren't consolidated until 400 years after Christ uh, and involved a, a, a discriminatory process of examination and debate, both philosophical and theological, uh, over a long period of time. So unless you at the, at the outset reject the possibility of divine inspiration. Uh, and I th think that that is actually a, a mistaken thing to do because um, the, uh, many people who are, we would consider secular, I mean, uh, uh, Mild, uh, Emerson, for example, poet. Um, have always talked about the idea of a muse. And what they mean by a muse is that there is an inspiration that can somehow come to us from the outside rather than being generated entirely from the... So unless you dismiss all of this, dismiss all of art, all of literature um, as somehow being so, nothing more uh, than something that is, that, that, that you may say defies external explanation, uh, but even 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 a creative person in the scientific domain um, uh, would have to admit, you know, the idea came to me as opposed to I generated the idea. And, and, and our deep sense that, that ideas come to us, uh, I think, opens up the possibility of transcendence. In other words, transcendence is not an exclusive prerogative of religion. 
it was there in philosophy and it's always been there in the arts. Right. So uh, the idea of uh, ideas coming to us, like I, I get that concept. It's very biological because, you know, our nervous system and, and the way we, we experience and the thoughts that come into our mind, we're kind of the last to know about them, the way our neurological system works uh, and our brain works. But um, I mean, I, I'm still having problems. So after like 400 years, you need to believe that the authors were in fact divinely inspired. Now that's where faith comes in, right? Well, I, faith comes in in asserting that, see, I mean, obviously, if someone says I'm divinely inspired, they're making a claim based on authority. Uh, they're, they say, they're saying God told me, in effect. Um, and I'm not saying that someone who ordinarily says that should be believed. Uh, I'm not saying that we should just take it on faith, you might say. Uh, and uh, because if so, uh, you'd have to take on faith, you know, every um, uh, every sage and Hare Krishna and every guy who says God told me to do this or God told me to do that. Now, it's important to realize that that neither religion nor philosophy have ever been based on that. Um, philosophy always begins in piety. Uh, if you look at the Republic, it begins with someone asserting something canonically. This is the way it is. And the Socratic process then begins by saying, how do we know? Uh, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by justice? What do you mean by truth? Um, but uh, Socrates never questions the fact that there is such a thing as justice and there is such a thing as truth. Uh, and so um, if you were to tell Socrates, by the way, Socrates, there's really no such thing as truth. You know, there are neurons firing in your brain. Uh, and as a result, uh, it is those chemical transactions that, that cough up this notion of truth. Uh, but that's your truth. Uh, and it's not necessarily somebody else's truth. And there's no way of going beyond your neurons versus my neurons and coming to some uh, understanding of truth itself, uh, I think, see, that is where you actually fall into a, a mechanistic description of truth that is not, that doesn't actually do justice to truth itself. Imagine if we were to look at justice that way. It's nothing more than the firing of neurons in our brain. Then I would say, well, who cares about civil rights? Uh, what makes those things, what makes that something that society cherishes and is actually willing to impose by the force of law? I mean, if a, if a restaurant says, I'm not going to allow gay people to eat here, we go into that restaurant and force them to do it. So we're assuming that there is a, a moral principle here that has, you may say, transcendent value. It doesn't matter whether or not your neurons are in sync with it. No one cares. No one cares whether you agree with it. Uh, it's going to be imposed on you one way or the other because it is a, and, and we don't even care if the majority rejects it. That's why we have courts to affirm them as, uh, you may say, constitutional principles. So uh, on what basis can you assert these principles as true without giving, granting them some transcendence that goes beyond human subjectivity? Hmm. Interesting. Um, do you, do you, uh, do you f ever worry about religions going too far, you know, including Christianity or Catholicism, uh, as far as like, you know, uh, gentle mutilation, anti-homosexuality rhetoric, you know, prayer being the top priority in the wake of tragedy. Um, do you see these all as, as major issues? Well, yes, I, I certainly think that uh, there is a, um, um, uh, whenever someone pro uh, purports to have the truth, uh, they, can, uh, they can try to impose that by force. Uh, and historically, we know that that was done uh, uh, very commonly. And it was done by the Catholics. It was done by the Protestants. Uh, it's, of course, being done today by radical Muslims. Um, but uh, I think we have to be e equally aware um, that the denial of truth, uh, nihilism, uh, also produces uh, genocidal results. Um, and, uh, in fact, the greatest perpetrator of human evil, certainly in modern times, have not been religious believers. They've been they've been atheists. Uh, and this would be true of, of Mao. It would be true of Stalin. It would be true of Hitler. Uh, Hitler wasn't an atheist per se, but he certainly was a despiser of Christianity. Um, and um, uh, and the roots of his fanaticism and his genocide uh, was ultimately in a certain reading of uh, Darwin's uh, philosophy of the survival of the fittest. Right. And uh, one uh, thing I would say to that is that I don't think you can really do anything terrible or good in the name of atheism because it's just the rejection of a claim. Um, but are you saying that uh, just being in that in that position on that claim, it can lead you to stuff like doing bad things? 
Yeah, see, I don't think you're actually thinking through the atheist premise clearly enough, because let me let, let me push it for a little bit, okay? Sure. Uh, if atheism is not, you can say that agnosticism is a, a, um, is a certain kind of uh, lackadaisical uh, position of, I don't know, and since I don't know, I'm not going to take a stand one way or the other. Now, I think agnosticism is realistic, it's unrealistic in life, because we frequently have to choose whether or not we know for sure. But nevertheless, like, the agnostic has always historically been a kind of an inert uh, character. Uh, Burke made the point that that typically these guys are, are sort of the dropouts of society. Now, I take atheism to be uh, one step beyond agnosticism because the atheist is ultimately making positive claims, um, things like there is no God. Uh, if, if, if the atheist doesn't say there is no God, then to me, it doesn't make any sense to call yourself an atheist. You're not. An atheist is someone who's actually asserting uh, that as far as he's concerned or she's concerned, there is no God. Uh, and as far as he or she is concerned, there is no life after death. And these are important practical assertions because you live your life according to that. So you're betting your life on it. You're betting your life that when you die, it, that's the end. Uh, and so you're, 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 you're voting even though you're pretending not to vote. Uh, now, the question is, what's the philosophical significance of that? And I would simply say that quite apart from, from outliers like Mao and, and you know, Pol Pot, take a philosopher like Nietzsche, who thought through his atheism and said to himself, if there is no God, then all the Christian values of compassion, you know, love your neighbor, uh, everybody has equal dignity. He goes, all of that is the shadows of God. All of that's nonsense. If there is no God, where'd that come from? Why should we affirm that? We're Darwinian creatures in the world. Uh, and ultimately, this is a, a brutal struggle for power, just as it is in the natural world. And why shouldn't it be a why should it be any different in the human world? And why should we take the powerful urge to dominate, subjugate, and destroy other people and treat that as though we've somehow refuted that, as though we've got some kind of a moral principle to trump that? What moral principle? Where'd that moral principle come from? So this is what I would call serious atheism. Uh, one of the reasons my debates with Hitchens were the high point of my debates on theological topics is he understands this. You know, he's not, he's one of these atheists who recognizes that when you strip away God, the dark side of human nature is thereby liberated, uh, and 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 there's nothing to stop it. Uh, and Nietzsche recognized that, and this is why Nietzsche actually despised the atheists of his time, whom he regarded as, as, as shallow and unserious, because he thought they didn't think through the implications of the death of God. Okay, um, so I I spent a lot of time with a lot of atheists, and uh, and you know, with, with Sam Harris, Richard Dawkins being the most prominent ones, and. Um, at least in the people that I've ever spoken to, I've never heard them describe atheism the way that you're you're describing it. So maybe the definitions are getting in the way here. Kind of what you're calling agnosticism is what they're calling atheism in that, you know, the, the atheist position is if someone makes a claim this God exists, uh, my response would be, okay, I'd like to see the evidence. And then if there is no evidence, the atheist position is just to not believe that claim. So that's that. See, that's not. You see, here's the problem with that approach to me, uh, and it's this: it's kind of like if I'm dating a dating a woman, and I'm thinking about whether I should propose, and I say to myself, you know what, she's got some good qualities, she's got some bad qualities, but if I'm trying to envision what life with her is going to be like, let's just say over the next ten or twenty years, there's no way for me to do that. I can't know for sure. Therefore, uh, I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait for the data to come in before I make a decision. Well, the truth of it is she's going to go marry someone else or tell me to, to at some point take a hike. Uh, she will take my abstinence as a no vote. Why? Because that is the practical significance of what I'm saying. Because I know the data will never be in. I'll never know for sure. And so I'm voting no, but pretending to vote maybe. Uh, and so to me, that's a fake. It's a fake because because in life, we actually have to live our life based upon choices we commit to, uh, even when we don't know for sure. I mean, here we are, we're flung into the world. We don't know how we got here, why we're here, what the purpose of our life is or what's going to come after death. We don't know. And it may be that we'll never know. And that being the case, all intelligent people nevertheless have to live a life that grapples with those questions and makes certain bets based on them. So if someone literally tells me, gee, since I don't know, um, I'm going to uh, 
take the position that there's nothing there and live my life based upon it. But I'm not really saying that there's nothing there because ultimately I'm, I'm merely suspended in, in its kind of indifference. I think that that reflects an, 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 an unwillingness to, to recognize that the skepticism of philosophy has got to be married to the dogmatism of action. In the end, we have to live our life based upon choices that we make, and, and the choice ultimately is a yes or no. Just like when you go into the presidential box, you can't say, gee, I don't really know what kind of President Trump is going to be, and since I don't really know, I'm going to kind of keep waiting until I figure it out. No, on election day, you have to vote, and our life is like election day. Well, I, I would say if, if it, we were in this vacuum uh, and I did have to pick a yes or no, I, I would have to pick no because I haven't seen any evidence for the existence of any gods. Uh, right, but uh, <laughs> look, part of it, I think maybe that we disagree about what we mean um, by evidence. And, and, and here's, what I, here's what I'm getting at. Uh, um, if you're a character in a play... Uh, let's just say Hamlet, uh, you could be looking for internal evidence. In other words, you're looking, for example, to see why Polonius did this and why Ophelia did that. You're inside the play. And if I come to you and I say to you, listen, this whole play, Hamlet, was created by this guy, William Shakespeare. And, ha and you're saying, well, I'm Hamlet. I don't really see it. I I'm in the play. I don't see any, I don't see Shakespeare. Uh, I only see Ophelia. I only see Polonius. I only see the acts that are occurring inside the play. And I can't get my head around the idea that some other guy, Shakespeare, actually made this whole play. So when we're looking for causality and we're looking for evidence, we have to be open to that kind of evidence. In other words, an evidence that supplies an explanation that is of a slightly different kind than the efficient causal explanations that science typically looks for. Well, this is going to be a really interesting event. I'm really looking forward, it, uh, forward to it. I think you and Matt are going to have one of the most important conversations, I think, uh, in the past maybe 10 years on this subject. So I, I'm really looking forward to it. Everyone can go to um, penguinphilosophy.com if they are interested in coming to the event and getting tickets. Um, I wanted to uh, touch on racism quickly, Dinesh, uh, and specifically anti-white um, racism. Uh, I've been running some a lot of polls and different questions uh, on social media, different social media platforms and asking people. It seems like 50% of the people on this planet don't believe that you can actually be racist towards a white person. How do you feel on this? Well, the people who say that, that you can't be racist uh, toward a white person, uh, have accepted uh, a kind of leftist um, a definition of what racism is. Uh, their definition is that racism is prejudice plus power and that uh, white people have historically had the power uh, and that white people have been racist by combining their prejudices against non-white people with their ability to harm them, discriminate against them, lynch them, and so on. Uh, according to this doctrine, uh, the reverse doesn't apply. Why? Because blacks and Hispanics can have prejudices. They may not like white people for whatever reason, but they don't have the power to implement those beliefs. So this is the theory uh, behind the idea that, um, that only white people can be racist and minorities cannot be racist against whites. Um, to me, uh, this is nonsense. Uh, not because the definition of racism is wrong. I agree with it. You need prejudice as well as power. Uh, but I think that in reality, uh, the minority activists today are far more powerful uh, than the so-called white nationalists. I mean, if you look at Charlotte Charlottesville, for example, the ragtag white nationalists in Charlottesville have absolutely no power. They don't have any political power. They don't have any cultural power. Uh, if the Ku Klux Klan were to have a rally, they'd be lucky to get 50 people and there'd be 500 people protesting them. Uh, on my contrast, Antifa, Black Lives Matter, these kinds of groups have uh, prejudices and they have enormous power. They have power not only because they have support in the Democratic Party, uh, but they have um, support in the media, they have support in Hollywood. Uh, in Berkeley, for example, the mayor of Berkeley, Jesse Aragon, wa was at least was, if he not still is, a member of an Antifa Facebook group. He's the guy who calls off the cops. He's the guy that allows these thugs to run loose in Berkeley and 
and also we see the same thing in places, places like Portland. Um, these are people who actually do have prejudices and power. And so for this reason, I think the notion that somehow they can't be racist is, is incorrect. Yeah, and uh, I mean, it seems like SWAT doesn't show up when Antifa shows up. Like, it, it, I mean, it, they don't treat this like a, uh, a riot, but it's, it, I see this, these, when Antifa shows up to do this violence, I, I see this as more of a riot than I do a, a peaceful protest. Well, this is the thing. Recently on CNN, one of the hosts was getting very angry at the phrase, at the phrase you know, mob justice. What do you mean by mob justice? Well, you know, it's one thing for people to protest. It's another thing to, you know, gang up on someone in an elevator, chase Brian Kilme to Fox News in the subway. Um, there's an attempt here to terrorize, to intimidate. Uh, and, and it's this that we're reacting against. It's, it's this that ultimately is fundamental, is undemocratic, because it is the enemy of free and open debate. Um, and, um, you know, if I have some common ground with the so-called new atheists, it's that it is that all of us have a certain suspicion of political correctness. We welcome genuine skepticism. Uh, and, and whichever side of the aisle, we fall um, on at the end, uh, we favor a process of vigorous argument, uh, challenging ideas, and not trying to ultimately beat someone into submission to your point of view. Yeah, I couldn't agree more on that. Uh, we need more people supporting free speech and intellectual discourse from all sides of the political spectrum. So let's finish on, um, on this uh, question. I always finish with my guests on this. What is the biggest ideological threat to humanity? The biggest um, ideological threat to humanity, uh, I think, um, is the idea that we have a right uh, to, the, to some other guy's uh, labor. Uh, when Lincoln defined slavery uh, in the 1850s, he described slavery this way, you work, I eat. So interestingly for Lincoln, slavery wasn't fundamentally about race. It was theft. One guy works, another guy takes the product of his labor, appropriates it to himself. Uh, and to Lincoln, this was the fundamental moral wrongness of slavery. And in theory, you, you could have white slavery based on the same principle. So I think what happens now is we keep hearing about social justice worldwide. Uh, and what the left basically says in social justice is we have social, we want social justice. To me, social justice is I get to keep what I earn and you get to keep what you earn. Um, if you're going to claim the fruits of my labor, you're stealing from me. Uh, and that principle, uh, I think, is uh, a great, I don't know if it is the most serious threat, but it's destroying countries like Venezuela right now. Uh, it's, it, it was a great threat to the world in the 20th century before the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, it is a pernicious idea. It's very powerful in this country and throughout the industrialized West. So if I had to pick a candidate off the top of my head, uh, I think I'd pick the, the uh, perverted philosophy that you work and I get to eat the fruits of your labor. Right. Well, Dinesh, thank you so much for coming on today. I really appreciate you uh, taking the time. My pleasure. Everyone, again, it's on November 29th in New York City. Uh, this will be Dinesh D'Souza and Matt Dillahunty having a conversation. Uh, this is going to be electric. Don't miss that one. You can go to penguinphilosophy.com for tickets. And uh, as always, let art and science inspire. Thank you. <laughs>